And so it's my uh, honor and, and privilege to uh, introduce to you uh, Stan Perlman. Uh, Stan is a professor of microbiology and immunology, also a professor of pediatrics, and I'm an emeritus professor in the same department as Stan, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Um, Stan has been working with coronaviruses for a long time, but what I'd like to do first, Stan, is ask you some background questions. Uh, where did you get your training, and how did you come to Iowa, and how has Iowa supported your research interest? Okay, so I started my training at uh, MIT, where I received a PhD in biophysics, and then I did postdoctoral fellowships in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, and at Harvard and at Brandeis in Boston. And then after that, I decided to go to medical school. That in itself is a story over some beers. And after going to medical school, I became a pediatrician and worked on pediatric, uh, became a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. And while doing that, I became intrigued by actually babies that were uh, having overwhelming viral infections. And often these infections in babies involve the brain. So I became, started thinking more about viruses in the brain. As part of my PhD work, I had done many things, including some developmental biology, looking at how uh, people and animals develop, and then also at viruses. So this was a natural step to start thinking about viruses in development. And it ended up in a circuitous path because once I chose a virus to work on it, I ended up working for many years on a virus uh, analog of the human disease, multiple sclerosis, which is occasionally a pediatric disease, but of course it's much more a disease of uh, young women and to a lesser extent young men, and sometimes older women and men. And then uh, after that, when SARS and MERS and SARS-CoV-2 uh, started infecting people then, it was easy for me to transition to working on these human viruses. We still work with the original mouse viruses that cause uh, this multiple sclerosis-like disease because I've always been interested really in how do viruses cause disease and that's that was the main focus of my research. I became, uh, inter I moved to Iowa after uh, having finished my pediatric residency and training uh, in Boston and part of the appeal was that uh, I was an easy place to work uh, it's an easy place to live. Uh, there's good people here. People are very collegial and uh, always willing to help. So all those things were very appealing. Some of the places I was at in Boston, that wasn't always true. So it was nice to be at a place where this was almost always true. So that's how I ended up here. Thank you, Stan. Um, so I want to now begin start talking about coronavirus infections. And the one thing that has intrigued me the most is how can there be asymptomatic infections and enough virus produced to spread as an infectious droplet? Well, I think that the amount that's spread in any respiratory virus infection is just uh, the amount of virus that's produced and how many can get on a droplet. So even in other ones, whether it be a cold coronavirus, such as uh, the common cold, the non-coronavirus common colds, or even the coronavirus common colds or other respiratory infections, what you need is you need to have enough virus produced in the upper airway in the nose primarily, and sometimes a lower respiratory tract too, but up, upper airway in the nose, and then you just have to have enough produced so that on a droplet you can spread enough virus to infect a person. We One of the things that's really not known for COVID-19 is how much virus is needed to infect another person. Uh, it's we in fact this kind of information is rarely known for some diarrheal illnesses we know something about this how much you actually need and this is called the infectious dose but for COVID-19 we really don't know and we the other thing that's changed now that's uh, different than in the past we have very very sensitive tests for measuring virus so the result is that you we can measure viral products such as RNA and this may not correlate with the amount of infectious virus so this is a confounding problem, both for sending people back to work and for thinking about how the virus is spreading. But the basic answer is, this is, I think, a math problem, just how much 
virus there is per droplet. And if you have a tiny droplet and not enough virus, uh, the virus won't spread so much by aerosoling. But if you have a, a lot of virus, like you have in measles, where you can spread by very, very tiny droplets, and that's why the virus can easily infect people all across a room, even if there's only one or two susceptible people in a room of 100 people, uh, measles may be able to infect those people. So then the other side of the coin is symptomatic infection. And in some cases, it's an over-inflammatory response. Comment on that? Yeah, so that's, this, this is really one of the mysteries about this disease. So it seems like everybody who gets infected has an infection in their nose and throat and upper airway. And for some people, or maybe most people, the virus may track to the lungs, but only in some people who the virus is in the lungs do they react to the virus. And what seems to happen is the virus is able to keep making more viruses in the lungs. It's able to replicate, it's not controlled well. And as part of that, or, and we don't know how the relationship between all these factors, but you end up, the host, the body itself starts reacting to those viruses and starts creating what's called an inflammatory milieu or a cytokine storm. And basically it's, it's the body's reacting in a way that's not helpful for the virus being cleared, being made to go away, and you end up with disease. But it's a mystery right now why virus is cleared in some people without a cytokine storm, why some people are utterly asymptomatic, that means they have no signs of disease, and they have virus and sometimes large amounts of virus, while other people react to the virus by having this excessive cytokine production. So this is a mystery and something that we, we need to know more about. Uh, we know that there are certain risk factors that make it more likely you will have a more severe disease. So people who have diabetes or obesity or hypertension or renal disease may do less well with the virus. We know that when you get older, uh, you have less, you do less well if you're over 70 or over 80. The risk factors are uh, that the aging itself is a risk factor. And this is, I, this has been an issue even in my family because we lost an, I lost an 89 year old and an 101 year old uh, to COVID. One of them direct infection, the 89 year old, and one, the person who was 101 indirect because she wasn't being visited by any of her family because of the shutdown that resulted from COVID-19. So old age is definitely a risk factor in several ways, not only just direct virus infection. All right, so then uh, the hope is, of course, vaccines. Uh, and a lot of the vaccines have focused just on the spike protein, which may give good neutralizing antibody. But how do you see these vaccines that have just focused on the spike protein giving a good T cell response? Yeah, so it depends on what kind of vaccine it is. There are some vaccines that are predicted to make a better T cell response than others, whether it's on the S protein or not, the spike protein or not. Sometimes the, uh, for some people, uh, the spike protein is a major target for what's called the T cell response. And to, for people who don't think about this, T cells are different than antibodies because everybody has, or not every, everybody has a set of uh, molecules which allows them to recognize virus in a certain way. And it's different from person to person. So for some people, the spike protein will be a fine target. For other people, it might be another protein as a better target, but there still should be a response to the uh, spike protein. What I'm more worried about is that the vaccine itself won't induce a T cell response, whether to the uh, spike protein or, or another protein, because uh, not all vi not vac these vaccines are not all equal. And this, of course, is one of the things about with 100 or whatever is 210 vaccines being studied and five to 10 being developed at high speed. We don't really know which is best. We don't know if they're all equivalent. We don't know if any of them will have longer lasting immunity. We don't know if any of them will have any side effects. So there's a lot of things that we don't know and we would normally in a normal vaccine development, we would know more about them, uh, but we can't because we recognize that this pandemic has gotten out of hand and particularly in the US, we need to have something uh, immediately. But there's a lot of concern that we're doing this really fast and whether it's gonna be good or not, uh, time will tell, unfortunately, we won't know. So I also uh, wonder about these vector vaccines, uh, like the adenovirus vector vaccine. Um, is there, can they give a second dosage or do they have to use a different approach 
after an adenovirus vector vaccine? Yeah, that's a good question because one of the uh, one of the groups that's using adenovirus vectors are using two different ones just for that problem. So, because well, what Dr. Stinsky is referring to is the fact that sometimes you make an antibody response to the first adenovirus, and then when you're uh, re-immunized with the same vaccine, you may start eliminating the immunogen or the vaccine faster than you can develop an immune response to the part of it, the spike protein that you care about. So you can get around that by not having the exact same target. Uh, but the, on the other hand, though, there seems to be some evidence that this isn't the problem. So the, one of the Chinese vaccines uses a very, very common adenovirus, and it seems to be working. So I would have predicted, that just like you would have, that this would have been a problem because we all would have had antibodies to this virus and it wouldn't work. But this virus seems to be as good as any other one on the market, again, with the limited number of my, uh, months and uh, patients who have received it. But that's uh, as right this second, we can't tell that there's any problem with it. So then Russia has declared they have a vaccine. Can you enlighten us on that vaccine? Yeah, if I remember correctly, that's, a, that's another adenovirus vaccine, isn't it? Um, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's an adenovirus vaccine. The problem with the Russian vaccine is not that it's not a possible fine vaccine, but it hasn't been tested. So that's the main concern with it. It, it It's predicted to make an immune response. It, um, it, sh it should be effective, but we just don't know. And in this country, we're worried about what's called phase three trials, where 30,000 people are immunized, and we want to make sure that there's evidence that the vaccines are effective and they're safe. So you put it on a large number of people, small compared to the total population of the US, but a large number of people. The whole phase three period was um, uh, not done with the uh, Russian virus, uh, with the Russian vaccine. And the Russians also have a, um, they have a, uh, they've also been approved for testing the uh, vaccine that originated in uh, Oxford, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is also a chimp, uh, chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine, which shouldn't have the same issues. But the real problem to me with the Russian one is that we just know nothing about it and it hasn't been tested in enough people. It, it might well work, but it would be, it might well not work too. And it, it should be safe, but it might not be safe. We just don't know these kinds of things when you move that quickly. So the other area I'd like to discuss with you is treatments. And remdesivir is good, but you've got to treat the patient very early on to make an effective clearance of the virus. You have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's predictable because in people who are getting severe disease, as we talked about, it's the virus instigates it, but what's ca causing the main problem is the host immune response. So you want to certainly want to do something to clear the virus, but if the host immune response has gotten out of control, well then getting rid of the instigating event may not be enough at that point. So remdesivir, I think works pretty well as an antiviral agent. It works well in the test tube and cells. It works well in experimentally infected animals where you can give the treatment at the same time as you give the infection. But in real life, in people, you don't know when the infection begins. And so all the data so far would say that you have to give it early for it to be useful, and it's not a surprise. In fact, one of the things when this remdesivir first came on the market, one of the things that I was really surprised about is they were using it only for compassionate use in patients who are in the ICU. I thought that was exactly the wrong population to demonstrate efficacy, because those are the people who don't really have much virus left anymore. If they do, it's not the main problem. And then it's now turned into more, I think you still have to be hospitalized to get remdesivir. The ideal goal would be to get a drug like remdesivir, make it oral, remdesivir is not oral, and be able to give it to people very early in the infection. So just like when somebody comes in who thinks they have the flu, you say to them, okay, it looks like you have the flu by this test, let's give you Tamiflu. And we know that Tamiflu works in the first two days of an infection, and after that, it's really not very useful. So the same thing would be true here. If we could give it to people who come in who are positive, have mild symptoms, particularly if you have high risk factors, such as the obesity and hypertension that I mentioned before, or if it's an older individual, then uh, those people would benefit from this mythical oral antiviral drug that could basically maybe abort the whole process before the host immune system uh, cuts in. 
Are there other drugs in, in the making that would look encouraging? Well, there are other, it's, this is a hard question because uh, the, there's a huge number of people who want to make contributions. So there's a huge number of drugs that I am being asked to test. And uh, so the, the, most of them won't work because they will work in the test tube. But when you get to an animal or experimentally infected animal or a person, the dynamics are just not right. Uh, you have to get, you, for any virus, for any uh, drug to work, there's so many things you have to do. So forgetting about things like how you manufacture it. You have to have a drug that can be absorbed or if it's given orally and if it's intravenous, that it has to be able to be formulated at the right dose. You have to know that the uh, drug can reach the area where the infection is. You have to know that the amount of drug that does reach the area is sufficient to inhibit the virus. So there's lots of things being tested and some of them are against the virus and some are against the host. And against the host, some of them will stop that immune response that we were talking about. Others may be against factors that the virus uses to make more virus, because we know that viruses are not, uh, they're not independent of the cells that they replicate in. When I first started doing uh, virology many years ago, uh, we used to think that a virus went into a cell and all it did was just basically use the machinery and make more viruses. We know that viruses now use a lot of the proteins actually in the cell to help them do those very simple processes. So if you can inhibit those proteins, maybe that'll help. But all these things are hard. And to get the, these uh, antiviral agents into a cell is not, not a trivial thing. So a lot of the drugs that are being developed will work great in a test tube because it's easy to get a drug into a cell in a test tube. But when you start getting to an animal or a person, it becomes trickier. So what are your thoughts about these monoclonal antibodies uh, to SARS-2? Monoclonal antibodies con a convalescent plasma also. They, they have similar uh, modes of action. So it's the same kind of issue. If you have an, enough antibody, such, such as you should have if you're vaccinated. So the goal of vaccination is initially to make enough antibody and enough T cells. So when you get reinfected, the virus can't go anywhere. So basically you're immune from the infection. And uh, the, the same thing if you, so if you give somebody antibody who was previously infected with the virus or monoclonal antibodies that were prepared in the laboratory, in theory, if they're present at a high enough level, they should prevent the uh, virus from being able to infect the person who's received the plasma or the antibodies. Whether that'll work or not is unclear. Uh, some, some infections, it does work. I think it has the same kinds of issues that we have with antivirals. You have to give it at an early enough time so that they can make a difference. So if you give it too late, then you may actually do more harm than good because you may start uh, having lots of antigen, which is from the virus, uh, mixing with the antibodies and causing other problems. So it's, it's, I think it's a good solution. We know it's a, under certain conditions. So what we used to do, Many years ago, when the measles vaccine, before the measles vaccine was about, we used to take uh, the same kind of thing. We used to take plasma or sera from people who had had measles, and we knew that some people were really at high risk for developing severe measles. We would give those people shots of this plasma or this sera uh, once a month to prevent them from getting measles, and it worked well. So certainly antibodies and this convalescent plasma will work, or almost certainly, if it's given before the infection. But when you already have somebody with an infection, it's more of a challenge to know exactly how to use it. So I think the jury's out. It's an area, it's a modality that's being favored, but uh, whether it'll really work or not, I think the jury's out. So then what about things when the infection has progressed using immune modulators? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the part that, uh, that's being, that people hours. are talking about We're now. Not always busy at for six full hours. There is right? there is um, evidence that uh, if there's a drug called steroids, which are used to stop immune responses, and these have uh, in some patients, this has been used before in SARS and in MERS, and wasn't terribly successful in either one. MERS, SARS it made patients worse, and in MERS it didn't do much of anything, but. What people have found now with the large number of patients who have COVID-19, if you take the very sickest ones who are in the intensive care unit 
and you give them steroids to tone down the whole immune response, they seem to do better. So this is now being uh, favored in a lot of situations, whether it really works or not in the real world, the only time will tell. But it always made sense that if you had too much of an immune response and not too much virus left, if you could just tone down that whole immune response, maybe the patients would do better. And then of course, there's more focused kinds of uh, approaches because steroids are like a uh, sledgehammer. Uh, they affect all parts of the immune system. What would be lovely is if we knew which parts were really the worst for outcomes and if we targeted those directly. And we're still, people are still working on that. So um, this is my last question. I would like to ask you about the genetics of the virus. As you well know, every time it replicates, it mutates. And will it evolve to be another cold virus? Or how do you see this all evolving once uh, an immune population develops? Yeah, this is, this is what people hope, of course, is that it'll turn into another cold virus. And that's, in fact, when we talk about vaccination even, if we had vaccines that prevented people from getting pneumonia but made them get a cold, as long as they weren't so contagious that they infected susceptible people, that would be okay because having a cold is annoying, but it's clearly not life-threatening. So whether this, whether this virus will ever do that, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's so hard to, to know what it'll do. There's, there's certainly speculation that even some of the common cold viruses that we have now common cold coronaviruses actually 100 years ago caused worse disease and then modulated to become a cold virus. Uh, the best, I think the best illustration we have of this actually is we've been doing studies with the MERS coronavirus and it turns out that's a really a disease of camels in the Middle East. But there was one instance where the virus was introduced into Korea and in Korea it was a single introduction so you could really follow how the virus behaved and of course, because it's 20, it was 2015, they were able to eliminate the virus. But while in the few months that it was around, what it actually did is evol it evolved to become less virulent. So it actually caused less disease. It didn't cause less disease, but in the test tube, it looks like it should have caused less disease. We didn't have enough patients to really know that it did cause less disease. But all the hints are that it was evolving to cause less disease. So I don't know what this virus will do. This virus is remarkably well situated to infect humans. It doesn't really need to mutate anyway. Uh, viruses that are very virulent may want to uh, mutate to become attenuated because it's killing too much of its host. But at one to 3% death, this virus probably doesn't really care that it, that kind of level doesn't bother it too much. So whether this will evolve or not is really a good question. As you said, these viruses like to change with uh, every time they divide because they don't, this particular one has the ability to um, uh, correct some of the errors it makes during replication, but it, they don't, uh, it's still not overwhelming. So you can get a lot of changes and uh, time will tell if these ever become really important and fixed into populations. So I think that's basically the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I think we could now take questions um, from the chat. Are you there, Tony? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you yeah. both very much. That was really fascinating and we are very lucky to have uh, you part of our university. Um, I've had a few questions come in from um, our chat. Uh, the first one being um, Dr. Perlman, um, what is, in your opinion, um, the public's response? How, how would you say the public's response to COVID has, has been? The public's response? Well, I think the public really responds based on the information it receives. So it, it, as uh, unfortunately, this virus has been politicized. So it's a little hard to just have the straight scientific facts being the determinant of how the public responds. So people have really, I, I don't think uh, anyone, even somebody like me who has access to a lot of the information, I still have to base any opinion I have on the information. So the, the public for some things has responded very well. I think that uh, there, were, there were things like lockdowns and shutdowns that uh, we probably needed to do a little differently in this country, maybe a little earlier, and that we uh, certainly the evidence is that we let up the lockdowns too early in some places. And uh, it's all, you need to have 
a strong motivation to keep going because it's very hard. If you're not working, you're not making money, you're sitting at home. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep doing all the right things. But at this point, uh, in a state like Iowa, we, we really haven't had a decrease in cases. It's still important that we still maintain social distance. We now know that masks are a help. Early on in January and February, we were thinking masks weren't really a help, but now we have more information and we think that they are a help. Uh, we know that uh, it, it you, it's really important that no matter what age, you don't get yourself infected because we know if you go home to grandma or if you go to a, a nursing home that you're likely, you may well infect the group that's very, very susceptible to infection. So I think that people, uh, that people are paying some attention, but uh, it's, they have to continue to pay attention. Important for young people is to not have a, a large gatherings without any masks or other protection. Uh, because that's the way the virus can spread. Were you consulted at all by um, the president of the university or anyone in athletics as far as what direction they should go? No, I've, t I've talked to the president of the university, but I have, wasn't yeah. consulted. Uh, but I have talked to, um, there's this people, there's the hospital epidemiologist and the people who do adult and uh, infectious diseases. So I've spoken to them. And I, so I think the hospital uh, has certainly knows what the, the the ideas and how to control this are. And I suspect the president does as well, because I think he's in contact with that. Above that, though, we I don't think we've had much luck uh, in talking to, uh, for example, the uh, state, anybody in the state at the state level. Uh, okay, so there's lots of questions coming in and you're, you're answering some of them uh, more than one at a time. So that's good. Um, let me see here. Is there a central communication center where researchers report in what they have found and they turn to send uh, researchers with new information out to get the word out? Well, yeah, so this is, this is an interesting question because until recently, um, information was published in journals. And so you had to go through a rather laborious process that Mark knows well about, where you submitted an article and then it would take you a couple of months and you'd have to deal with it and maybe the journal would take it and then maybe two months later it would be published. And so it could be six to eight months later. So, but what's happened more recently is they have these uh, online servers where people put in their work as soon as they uh, have written a paper before they're been peer reviewed as it's called and been in a journal. So these, uh, so these, this information is available as soon as it's, uh, basically as soon as the manuscript is finished. So people share information very quickly. The downside of this is that a ton of the information on these websites are, are not accurate. So, or they're misleading or they, they um, exaggerate the value of what they actually found. So they, there's both a good and a bad side, but certainly the, we are much better being able to access to uh, information that's important and we can get it very quickly. In fact, some journals require you, as soon as you submit a paper there, to uh, upload it into one of these preprint uh, venues. And the other thing is the World Health Organization has requested all papers uh, dealing with COVID-19 be sent to them at the time of submission. So we actually have another way of making sure that information is shared. And then we also have a huge number of meetings, almost on a week, more than a weekly basis, almost a daily basis, where different groups get together and share data. So there's lots of ways that we're actually sharing information much earlier than we would have before. So speaking a little bit more about some of the conflicting reports coming out, uh, school in Iowa is, is starting here soon. Um, we've seen different reports about younger kids or certain ages being more susceptible, less susceptible, more um, likely to spread the disease. What's sort of your opinion on, on kids in school? Yeah, so right, the information that we originally had is it seemed like young children didn't get infected and didn't spread the virus. Then we have more information now, well, young children do get infected, but maybe they don't spread the virus. So I think we don't know what children under the age of 10 will actually do in terms of spreading the virus. Certainly we know that the common cold, anyone who has a two-year-old at home who goes to daycare or a three-year-old knows that the adult in the household will be infected all the time. So they're a natural conduit for uh, colds into a family. But this virus, we don't really know what it'll do. It may well turn out to be the same thing, but right now we think children are less likely to be infected and less, or maybe not less likely to be infected, but less likely to spread the virus to other people. 
Um, and then after that, it, I think it depends on how much virus is in your nose and upper airways and how much you're coughing as to how much you spread the virus. And even if you're not, if you have enough virus that you've been talking, you may be able to spread the virus. Uh, so a couple technical questions here. I don't know if I'm going to be pronouncing some of this right, but can you speak to the airborne aerosolization and the use of respirators versus masks or face coverings during or close exposure to a COVID-19 positive person? Yeah, so this is one of the things that's changed over the last uh, few weeks is that we've become, have a greater appreciation of how the virus can spread by these very, very fine aerosols that uh, Dr. Stinsky talked about early on. So because of that, those can spread much further. And because of that, they in theory could uh, uh, hit a mask or go under a face shield. So, but other studies show that even if you have this fine of aerosolization, it's most important within the same six feet that we were telling people to stay apart before. So yes, the virus may spread like this. Yes, it's a, a more of a, a worry because if you're going to get infected by an aerosol, uh, then you have to have different precautions. Most of what we know about this is that the aerosol spread thus far, and everything seems to change quickly in this infection. But what we know thus far is that aerosolization is most important in areas indoors with poor circulation. So if you have very good circulation, if you're outdoors, I, it, uh, this risk is uh, can still occur. There's still a risk, but it's really low. If you're out running and you pass another runner, uh, the odds of you're being able to share an aerosol is really tiny, not impossible, but really, I wouldn't worry about it. Six feet, if you're with your friends six feet apart in a park, particularly if there's a bit of a breeze, I think you're pretty well protected and wear a mask as well. Uh, what are some of the expected post-COVID effects on someone's body? They've had the disease, they've survived it. Yeah, I think we're learning about this. There's a lot of people who seem to have uh, effects that last longer than just the effect of the virus. So we know that people, some people are having a, a chronic lung problems. They may have originally had lung problems that have gotten worse or they develop lung problems. They have trouble catching their breath. We don't know, we, th we hope that this will go away but I don't think we have enough information yet to know how long it'll take. We think it mostly will go away. Some people have heart, their, their hearts involved by the infection. So for those people, we worry more that uh, the, uh, the uh, long-term effects may be a problem. Some people get neurological, uh, in, it's not an infection, it's just neuro, or neurological consequences of the infection. That may also take a while to go away. And then this, uh, along with that, there's psychiatric complications that can also be a problem. And a lot of that is just as I was mentioning earlier with the 101-year-old year, 101 year old person in my family, you have other psychological effects if you're stranded in your home, you're not seeing anybody. Uh, so these, these effects can be almost as important as a direct infection. Oh yeah, that's um, scary. You don't always think about all of those secondary uh, effects and problems. Uh, HCQ, what's your thoughts on that as a preventative measure? Uh, HCQ, you mean the one that's been disproven? Yes. It's been disproven. Uh, you know, they, they, this, it's an interesting drug in the sense that it has, two, you can imagine having two kinds of effects. So we originally thought about it for coronaviruses because it turns out that in some ways when the virus enters the cell, it uses a method of entering the cell that could be sensitive to hydroxychloroquine. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 we know that in fact, that method of entry is not the way the virus enters cells in the lungs. So from a theoretical point of view, there was never a reason to think it was gonna be great. The other thing hydroxychloroquine does is it has anti-inflammatory effects. So that second phase of the illness when people have a hyperimmune response, maybe it would help there. So if it, if it hadn't turned out to be politicized and it was all, you know, this all started with a French scientist who actually did uh, uncontrolled studies and said that people got better. And those were, uh, those were really poor studies. And um, then it was picked up as a possible way to uh, prevent the disease and uh, even cure the disease. But the data from the beginning, it was from the beginning, I thought that it was unlikely to work because theoretically it shouldn't work. And that's what occurred in the long term. There's been some, the, unfortunately, some people suffered from the side effects of the drug. Uh, so uh, that's for, that was very, very unfortunate. But again, this is a whole part of, of 
of politics getting involved because it was pretty easy to do this straight scientific uh, study and say, okay, it probably won't work. We want to test it, not give it to people before testing. Then when it was tested, it was found not to work very well. Uh, good, that's good to hear. Um, do you involve students in your work, in your lab? Yeah, yeah, I have, I have two graduate students and other trainees in my lab too, several postdoctoral fellows. And so how is that uh, social distancing and, and all of that going with your work? Uh, that's a really good question. So we never shut down even at the, when the university shut down. So we kept working. We, we probably don't do as good a job with social distancing as we should, but we all wear masks and face shields. So it's, it's a little hard in the lab to uh, uh, really keep social distancing if you have enough people in the lab. But, we, but, but very, everybody's very aware of it. I certainly don't go into the lab without wearing a face shield or a mask. So, and I think most people are pretty good about that as well. We haven't had anybody be, become ill. This, we had actually one, it's one, there's one person in the lab who, whose uh, uh, significant other became COVID-19 positive, developed pretty bad disease. She stayed home with him. She never developed any symptoms. And uh, after two weeks, she came back. Uh, and so, and this is not an uncommon story where you have, to have someone who should be infected and should develop disease and they don't. So this is one of the mysteries of the disease. So what, what's our, our end game here? What do we need to do to stop this? And when do you think it'll be stopped? Well, I think you have, an, have to have enough people have immunity to the virus and that the immunity has to work well enough to at least prevent the severe pneumonia so that people, if they get anything, get the cold or maybe they'll get nothing. Seems unlikely you will we'll get what's called sterilizing immunity where they have no, uh, no virus whatsoever after exposure to the virus. But we don't really care as long as they have either no disease or uh, mild disease, and as long as they don't shed the virus so that they can infect other people. So when will this occur? What do we have? I don't know, probably in the US now, like in Iowa, 2% of people are tested positive. I suspect the number is probably near to 10 to 20% of people have seen the virus based on other studies. And if you get up to around 70%, uh, you may have a society that's protected enough so it'll do uh, pretty well be great if we get there with a vaccine and not by having 70% of the population infected, because if we have 70% infected, we'll have uh, lots more deaths. So that's what we'd like to avoid. When will we get there? We'll have a vaccine in the uh, uh, fall and larger amounts probably at the beginning of next year in the middle of next year. So after that, people will be vaccinated. But the, but the other thing about this whole thing, of course, is people have to be convinced that it's safe to take the vaccine, that they want to be vaccinated. Uh, this country, there's a big, anti-vaccine uh, group, uh, even if it's only five or 10% of the population, there's another 10% who are skeptical and they're very vociferous. So it's important that uh, people get the vaccine, but it's also equally important that they know the vaccine works and is safe. So you've mentioned social distancing, masks, what else can Hawkeye Nation do to, to help stop the spread? Well, social distancing is the most important thing because I think that what I worry about with, for example, the University of Iowa has students coming back. Uh, students have to uh, really pay attention and uh, that's very hard, especially if you're in a dorm. Classrooms are going to be set up so there's less contact there, but I worry much more about the bars and restaurants than I do about the classroom as a place for virus to spread. So social distancing, washing hands, uh, wearing masks, just being generally thoughtful about uh, how, if you are sick, how you could be spreading the virus to someone. And if you're not sick, how do you protect, protect yourself from getting infected? And we're, we're running out on time here. So um, we are recording this. So if anyone missed it, we'll put it up on YouTube at a later date. But maybe just one more question. I had some questions about what's in the boxes behind you. Oh, you, you know what's in the boxes behind me? It's actually funny. Those are all. Tyvex, so that's the equipment you use in the BSL-3 lab. We, we, um, there was a period when we were worried that we wouldn't have enough equipment, so uh, one of my friends bought some and sent it to me, so it's been stored in my office uh, ever since. So we have the, those are the gowns that people wear uh, when they go up into the, the facility where we work with the virus. And, to, and also on the other side, are there are the kinds of protective uh, masks that are not, it's not quite a face shield, it's called a papper but something to protect people who are up there from breathing air that might have the virus. 
So that's why there's all these boxes, not because I'm about to move from Iowa. It's, uh, it's all this protective equipment. Yeah, so we definitely do not want you to move from Iowa. Um, there is a way for everybody on this call to actually support you, and I'm going to put that link in the chat right now, and it takes you right to the Department of Microbiology Fund. Um, you can give to that and actually give to COVID re research through that. I also want to take just a brief moment and talk about our next chat from the old cap, which will be uh, another doctor. So um, this month is all doctors on chat from the old cap. It just kind of turned out that way. But um, Dr. Ted Abel will be our guest. He's the director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, and he'll be talking about sleep and memory loss. Uh, and I will put that link up in the chat as well, so you can register there. Well, Dr. Stinsky and Dr. Pro Dr. Perlman, thank you very much for being part of our show. Um, I've gotten lots of um, text messages and comments in the chat that this was just very helpful and they really enjoyed um, being part of it and they got to learn things. So that, of course, is what we love to hear. We know that uh, university has some pretty talented minds and you two are certainly right at the top there, possibly in the country. It's great to know that we have such great researchers, doctors, PhD uh, at our university. So we can't thank you enough for being part of our show today. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Yep.